1993, and uh, then went on to do a postdoc with Michael Jordan at MIT, uh, was an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, then went to the awesome era of machine learning and AI at AT&T Labs Research, took a year off to become chief scientist at a venture capitalist firm called Syntec Capital, and then moved to the University of Michigan starting in 2002, where he is now a full professor. And his research interests focus on developing autonomous agents that can learn in complex, dynamic, and uncertain environments. And his most notable achievement to date, which just happened this year, in 2011, he was elected a AAAI Fellow for significant contributions to reinforcement learning, including seminal theoretical results on algorithm properties and the foundations of dynamical system representations. So he will be doing a tutorial on reinforcement learning for you. Thank you, Jennifer. You should wait until at least I've said something. No. You may regret it. Um, well, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you are old enough to have seen Monty Python, but I do feel like saying, and now for something completely different, uh, because, um, you know, you've heard a lot of supervised and unsupervised learning, and we're going to do reinforcement learning. And my impression from these sorts of events is that most of the students have had very little exposure to reinforcement learning. So let me actually verify that. How many of you have taken a class in reinforcement learning? Some. More than, but four or five. Um, so for those of you, I think today's part of the talk will be quite uh, straightforward. But for the rest of you, it'll be, it'll be a, a tutorial to, on reinforcement learning. And tomorrow, I'll focus on more advanced topics. Um, let's see. So uh, let me begin. Let's see if this works. This works. Let me begin by uh, showing a few pictures of uh, great collaborators I've had uh, whose work has influenced uh, this, this material that you'll see today, including my students who have finished and our colleagues. Uh, so all of these are colleagues who've, uh, who've helped uh, shape my ideas that I'll be presenting uh, today. OK, so um, here's an organization of the tutorial. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about what is reinforcement learning and use that to distinguish uh, this, these slides to distinguish from uh, supervised and unsupervised learning, then uh, and, and introduce sort of the key problems of reinforcement learning. Then I'm going to talk about the banded problem setting, which is probably the simplest reinforcement learning setting. Then I'll dive into MDPs, which is the uh, simplest full uh, reinforcement learning class of problems, but focus on the small MDP case. And that's what I'm going to be doing today, because the foundational algorithms are all uh, for the small MDP setting. And they lay the groundwork for everything else that comes. And then I'll get into more advanced stuff uh, tomorrow. OK. So uh, what is reinforcement learning? Uh, in this bit of slides, I've prepared different sort of modules. In this module, um, I'm going to talk about agent environment interaction. It's a pretty different scenario than supervised and unsupervised learning. So I'll spend some time on that. And I'm talk I'll talk about three key challenges in reinforcement learning. Uh, one of them is exploration versus exploitation, because the agent is acting in the world. Should it act to explore? Should it act to exploit? You might have heard about exploration. I haven't been here for the, uh, I just came in this morning. So I don't know if uh, there was, was there any talk about exploration exploitation? No, OK. So we'll talk about exploration exploitation. We'll talk about another really key problem in reinforcement learning called the temporal credit assignment problem, or learning from delayed rewards. And that I'll spend some time describing that. And then I won't talk so much about what's the generalization problem, which is the problem that actually you've been hearing about for the last several days, right? which is to generalize from small amounts of data which is also there in reinforcement learning. It's these other two problems, exploration, exploitation, and temporal credit assignment problem that reinforcement learning adds that are not there in supervised learning. So in some sense, supervised learning problems are contained within reinforcement learning. And I won't spend much time about that, basically because uh, for the most part, we just borrow techniques on, on generalization from the supervised learning field. And then tomorrow, <coughs> uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to go from the optimal control uh, and engineering point of view that you'll see today towards a broader perspective of artificial intelligence, which is really where my interests uh, lie these days. So a uh, quick uh, just one sentence description of the three different legs of reinforcement of uh, machine learning. When I teach machine learning, 
I say to my class, you know, there are three legs to machine learning, supervised learning and supervised learning, reinforcement learning. On the other hand, I know that most of you who take machine learning classes get exposed to the first two and get almost nothing on the last one, which is reinforcement learning. So supervised learning, you've all seen it, learning from examples, classification, regression, unsupervised learning, dimensionality reduction, clustering, uh, uh, you know, density estimation. And again, reinforcement learning is learning approaches to sequential decision making. Learning from a critic is a phrase we often say. Learning from delayed reward, which we'll talk about in great detail. Now, another way to, to sh sort of show how reinforcement learning is different from the rest of machine learning is to show the influences that feed into reinforcement learning and what reinforcement learning feeds out to, because they are different from the rest of machine learning. So reinforcement learning really started in mathematical psychology. Uh, people were interested, psychologists were interested in trying to figure out how animals learn. And the, mathemat the mathematically minded psychologists came up with simple reinforcement learning methods for, um, or, or um, reinforcement learning algorithms, if you like, to explain how animals might learn. And those are the initial um, inputs into reinforcement learning, optimal control, operations research, neuroscience, because of course, uh, to the extent that reinforcement learning explains how animals behave, there must be reinforcement learning going on inside the brain. In fact, there's very concrete evidence for reinforcement learning inside the brain that we won't talk about uh, in this, in this uh, setting. And of course, AI, uh, one way to think of reinforcement learning is machine learning applied to the broader AI question of agents acting in environments, which is um, something that supervised and unsupervised learning doesn't really fully address. Okay, I want to read this one quote because it's, uh, it's, it summarizes one of the starting points of reinforcement learning. Uh, of several responses uh, made to the same situation, those which are accompanied or closely followed by, um, closely followed by uh, something, some good thing, uh, become more firmly connected with that situation so that when it reoccurs, they are more likely to recur. Those which are accompanied are closely followed by discomfort to the animal. Will other things being equal have their connections to that situation weakened? Right? Very simple idea. You do something. If something good happens, you try to do that again when you're in a similar situation. You do something, something bad happens, well, then all, you know, all other things being equal, you try and do that less often when you're in similar situations. Of course, what's a similar situation? What does it mean something good happens? Maybe something good happens immediately. Maybe something good happens after a long time. All of these are interesting challenges that reinforcement learning will have to get to the bottom of. But this is called the law of effect, and it's really the underlying principle behind, behind reinforcement learning. So lots of applications. I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on applications today. I might show you a quick demo <laughs> or two just to um, you know, get you to wake up after seeing a bunch of uh, uh, theory and, and equations. But you know, kind of applications are different from supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Right? The control applications, action-based applications, robotics, control, all kinds of control problems, games, uh, you know, traditional operations research, warehousing, transportation, things of that sort human-computer interaction, all of these very different applications from supervised and unsupervised learning. OK, so here is the obligatory sort of one uh, single diagram of an agent interacting in an environment. So you have a robot-like agent. It's in this closed loop interaction with the environment. It's uh, sensing the environment, perception, observation. These are two different words sometimes used. It's acting in the world. It's getting some sort of feedback from the world, which is uh, this reward signal that we'll get into more detail about. So if you complete agent, it's, it's temporarily situated, it's acting in time, it's continually learning and planning, and the distinction between learning and planning I'll talk about. Um, its object is to affect the environment, to control the environment, to get into desired situations, to get more reward, that's the problem. And the environment can be stochastic and uncertain. Right? So that's the setting of the agent interacting with the environment. By the way, feel free to interrupt at any time. I think it's late in the afternoon, and if you're like me, you'll be sleepy. So ask questions at any time you want. Uh, I'm happy to make this as interactive as you want. So that was a um, uh, more lifelike diagram. Here's, a, here's the abstract diagram we often see. Um, so let me use it to do some notation. So it's, I'm going to be, today I'm going to be talking about discrete time interaction. So every time step, something happens. So I'd say at time step t, the state of the environment is s sub t. It emits an observation or perception, O sub t. It, uh, the um, agent observes the observation, O sub t, and updates its estimate of the environment state. So it's maintaining an estimate of the unseen, potentially unseen state of the environment. 
and then takes an action A sub t, which generates a reward R sub t, and then the environment transitions stochastically to S sub t plus 1. And this cycle repeats. So it's this sort of closed loop interaction that happens between agent and environment. And our objective is to basically for the agent to, to learn how to act. And we'll get to that more formally in a minute. So here's some more notation. Uh, states are set S. Observations are set O. Actions are set A. Transition dynamics are T. So T of S A S prime is the probability of transition to S prime when the agent does action A in state S. The reward is R. R of S comma A is the reward the agent gets when uh, it takes action A in state S. I'm going to use PR for probability. Subscripts usually denote time. Uh, and superscripts will usually denote indices into a set. So just some basic notational things. One more notational thing. And this is the last notation slide. So I'm often going to talk about a history of interaction. The agent has been acting for some time. It has some history. In a learning setting, that's the data it has seen. So h sub k is the history from the beginning of time to time step k. So it's first observation, first action, first reward, second observation, second action, second reward. So that's history up to time k. And sometimes I will use a notation that says, I guess there is a pointer here, right? Turn around, press what? There. OK, uh, I'm going to talk about history sampled from an interaction between an agent and an environment as H sampled from the interaction. Why is, why is history random? Because the agent could be acting randomly, because transitions in a state happen randomly. Rewards can be generated randomly. So there's all kinds of randomness that generates these, these, uh, these things. OK, so what's the agent's goal? Let's begin, be, begin to get formal about what the agent's objective is. There are many different types of objectives that are used within reinforcement learning. Let me define for you formally three different types of objective by defining what are called utility functions. So utility, there are three types of utility. Let's spend a little bit of time on this because I'm going to use this. So if you don't understand this, stop me. I want to make sure you get it. So there's some history H that's happened between the agent and the environment. Now remember the histories have observations, actions, and rewards. How good is that history? The agent is trying to achieve good histories. What's a measure of goodness? Here's the measure of goodness. We're talking about three different settings. The finite horizon setting, where the agent is going to live for a finite amount of time, capital T. So the index little t is the amount of time remaining. So basically, it's the sum of the rewards in the history in time, the last t time steps. That's one way to take a history and map it into a goodness number, utility. So u of h, u sub t of h in the finite horizon setting is the utility, the goodness of this history if there are t time steps remaining. Then often we study infinite horizon problems where the history of interaction is infinite. And then here is one of the standard ones, which is a discounted sum of reward. So this is a discounted sum of reward over time. So gamma is a scalar between 0 and 1. Let's say it's 0.9. What does this mean? This means that a dollar today so a dollar tomorrow is worth 90 cents today if gamma is 0.9. So it's a discount factor. Okay? So it's an exponentially decaying amount of uh, reward in the future. OK. Um, we'll also allow for gamma equal to 1 with infinite horizon, but then we'll require this sum to be finite. The way we require the sum to be finite is a technical thing called all policies are proper. I won't get into that. Then another. A very standard utility is the average reward utility, where you're trying to maximize the average reward over the infinite horizon. So now I've defined for you, in some sense, the problem, the reinforcement learning problem. You have an agent. It's acting in the world. When it acts in the world, it gets rewards. It controls, it changes the state of the world. And how good is a particular interaction? Different measures. We can use any, either of, any of these, depending on what the setting is, what the problem is. Let me finish by saying now what the goal is. So the goal, the formal goal, is to behave so as to maximize expected utility. That's it. That's the reinforcement learning problem. An agent's interacting in the environment. Its goal is to maximize expected utility, measured in the finite horizon, the average case, the discounted case. 
The cool thing about this is that it seems very straightforward and simple, but it's a very, very general problem. Right? Basically, it allows for arbitrary preferences over agent behavior. It allows for arbitrary notions of goals and sub-goals and multiple goals. If you come from an AI background, you're familiar with the notion of goals and sub-goals and multiple goals, balancing different goals. All of these can be formulated in this very general way. If you have questions about this, if you, if you don't believe this, or if you, don't, if you have thoughts about this, ask a question. Yes? Are there standard form of utility functions, or is it subjective? So, you know, almost all of reinforcement learning starts by saying, here is the utility function. So for example, if you're, let's take an application. If you are trying to deliver mail, you get a reward every time you deliver mail correctly. The uh, utility is the average reward. Optimizing that would maximize the amount of mail that gets delivered most efficiently. If you are building an elevator scheduling system for a bank of buildings, and you decide that what you want to minimize is the amount of wait time, then you punish proportional to negative reward for amount of wait and then maximizing the utility will minimize wait time. So that's how people think about it, right? They have a particular problem. They have an objective. They want that problem to be, to be achieved in that problem. And then that defines the reward function. That defines the utility. Now, it's actually a very interesting question, how to define the utility function. I made it sound like it's very easy and very simple. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to talk about this question. Where do utility functions come from? So part of my talk tomorrow is going to be on that question. In fact, it's a very active area of research in my group uh, is exactly this question. Where do rewards come from? But for today, I'm certainly going to assume the usual RL framework, which is the rewards are given, the utility function is well defined, and the objective is to have the agent behave so as to optimize that utility. Yes. So when a discount factor is less than one, they won't diverge. The average reward won't diverge. The finite horizon reward won't diverge. So the only one that can diverge is if you add up the rewards over infinite horizon. Turns out, if you're in that, you don't do that unless you are in a setting where basically um, uh, you get zero reward after some finite amount of time, except that that time is not fixed which means that the rewards utilities are finite. So finiteness is not an issue. It's just, um, it's just I, I just wasn't very careful about it. Yes? You said that you work in this agent. Is it plural or singular? Are you working this in So I'm going to only talk about single agents. Maybe tomorrow we can have some questions about multiple agents, if you like. But today, at least, a single agent setting. So if an agent in an environment uh, and trying to uh, optimize utility. You know, this is, again, this is a very general problem. I would claim that, you know, our life uh, is a RL problem. We are agents. We have sensors. We have actuators. We have a subjective notion of utility, reward. And uh, we are, one can claim that uh, life is an RL problem in that we are trying to act so as to <laughs> optimize some notion of cumulative reward. Uh, right? That's a pretty reasonable way of thinking about the animals, including us. OK, so uh, again, no, notation. The objective is to maximize expectation or all histories sampled or some way of behaving and maximizing this uh, expectation is the objective for reinforcement learning. OK. Yes? So this is the uh, expectation. And, uh, and this is just the expectation so over. C is M, is that yes, so, so maximize over all ways of behaving. And we'll think of ways of behaving as policies. I'll make that more precise in a few minutes. And so it's the, the history that the, the interaction that gets generated depends on how the agent is behaving. So actually, this should be policy, not policies. So you fix a policy that generates a distribution over histories, that generates an expectation. You're trying to maximize uh, these, this expectation. So M is for maximize? Or? 
No, M is the environment. M is the MDP, sorry. M is the environment. M is the environment, E is for expectation, H is the history, U is utility, H is history. OK. All right, so what are the, let me now make sure you get the three big challenges that the, H, the RL faces. Basically, one of them is exploration exploitation, right? You're an agent, you're acting in the world, you have some partial knowledge about the world. Should you act so as to maximize the reward you can get based on your current knowledge? That's exploitation. Or should you act so as to improve your state of knowledge so that later you can get more reward? That's exploration. So you have to balance this exploration and exploitation. It's called exploration and exploitation dilemma. It's called exploration and exploitation trade-off, all different terms for the same, idea, same question. Notice this is not an issue in supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Active learning gets closer to this. But in standard supervised and unsupervised learning, this is not an issue. So this is one of the big challenges in, in reinforcement learning. Here's another big challenge. It's called the delayed reward or temporal credit assignment. Say you play a game of chess and you lose. So you lose, you get a minus one reward. So now you've made 100 moves and you've lost. How do you figure out which move was responsible for the loss? How do you assign credit or blame in a temporal sequence for the outcome, for the delayed outcome? It's possible that you played perfectly except for the very first move or the 15th move or that you played many moves badly. How do you figure that out by playing? That's temporal credit assignment or dealing with delayed reward. Right? That's also not there in supervised learning. And it's a core problem within, uh, within reinforcement learning. And the final problem is, is the more familiar one, the generalization problem. Right? You're acting in the world. You're going, to see uns you're going to see things you've never seen before. You want to generalize from what you've already learned to things you haven't seen before, to situations you haven't seen before. And that's the usual generalization problem. And again, I really won't spend much time talking about generalization simply because supervised learning is where the action and generalization is, and we just basically borrow ideas from supervised learning for the generalization part. Are these questions clear? Because if they're not clear, then it, my, you know, the rest of it won't make much, much sense. Yes? There, will, there can be arbitrary other effects. So the agent acts. The environment has some um, next state. It's chosen randomly, which could be influenced by the action of the agent, could be influenced by other things. We're not going to we're, we're model it. You see a, the formal model in a few minutes. Um, but yes, in general, the environment, the agent acts. The environment is the next state distribution which is influenced by the choice of action. Clearly, if the agent's actions don't influence the environment at all, then there isn't a much very interesting problem. Because no matter what the agent does, the environment does the same thing, then there's not an interesting control problem. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so the games are multi-agent settings, so there really are two agents. For the most part, I'll think about single agents. So imagine you're playing against a fixed player. So I'm playing against, I'm playing chess, and I'm playing against uh, GNU Chess, which is a software program that plays in a fixed way. So it's an agent, but it's really just part of the environment. I make a move. There's a next board that happens after the other agent moves. Right? So clearly, the next board I see when I make a next move will be influenced by what I do. But something else also plays a role, and that's OK. The, question, the distinction is, am I modeling a single agent, or am I modeling multiple agents? That distinction is an important distinction, but I'm going to stay with a single agent setting. So we're going to model single agents. But the environment chooses the next state as a function of its previous state and the agent's action, but can add random noise to it. You'll see, you'll see, you'll see uh, uh, more in a, in a few minutes. OK. Let me anticipate something I'm going to do tomorrow, uh, which is sort of to 
in the more advanced topics. Um, today I'm going to focus on the sort of, you know, the, the classic RL problem. States are given, actions are given, reward functions are known. What the reward function is known, what the model, uh, what models to learn or build or know uh, or have uh, is also known. And of course, when you think about general purpose AI, which is where my interests primarily lie these days, uh, all of these are unknown. And so bulk of what I'll talk about tomorrow will be how to deal with these sorts of issues. But today, I'm going to assume these, these things are, are known and available. OK. I should have said that um, you can find problems, classes of problems, where you have one, any subset of these issues. So I will start by problems in which there is only the exploration exploitation problem. No temporal credit assignment problem, no generalization problem. Then we look at problems where you have both exploration, exp actually, we have only the delayed reward problem with no exploration exploitation problem. Then we look at problems where you have both exploration exploitation and delayed reward. I'm, again, not going to deal with generalization. Yes? OK. Um, you know, you're going to see that in great detail. Just ask me this again in a few slides if this is unclear. Because we're going to now move to, a, to the bandit setting, which really is purely focused on exploration exploitation. So this is what's called an N-arm bandit. Um, what's a one-arm bandit? A one-arm bandit is a slot machine, right? You pull a slot, pull the, uh, the arm, and you, know, you, get, you get some reward or not. And you pull it again, you get some reward or not. That's a one-arm bandit. There you only have really one choice, pull that arm. I guess you have another choice, which is to stop playing. In an N-arm bandit, you have N arms, and you can pull any of the N arms whenever you want. And when you put an arm, you get a random reward. So now you have this setting. You have n arms or n actions. Each arm has some known or unknown true expected reward. So E of, no, not this. E of R1 is the expected reward from R1 or action 1. Expected reward of action 2, expected reward of action. And the agent's objective is, of course, to maximize utility say, the summed reward over time. Now, um, now, why do I say it's purely exploration, right? There is, there's no state space here. That is, you're in front of the slot machine, and every time step, your actions have no influence on what actions are available to you. See, in chess, when you make a move, the board changes. What actions are available to you changes. Here, in a slot machine, there is no state space, no physical state space. You're in front of a slot machine. You can pull any arm you want at any time. What arm you pull now has no influence on what happens on other arms down the road. Right? So there's no, there's no state space. There's no temporal credit assignment. There's no delayed reward. You pull an arm now, you get the reward right now. There's no delayed consequences of that pull. Right? The next arm you pull has, has no, is not influenced in any way what reward you get by what happened the f by the first arm pull. So there's no temporal credit assignment. There's no generalization. Right? I'm just pulling an arm. There's no features of the arm. I can't learn from one arm or another arm. Every arm is completely distinct. So there's no generalization. So it's pure exploration exploitation. Right? Because at any given point of time, I face the following choice. I've pulled some arms. I've gotten some rewards. Pure exploitation would be to pull the arm that has given me the most reward so far. Right? Pure exploitation would say, arm three gave me the most reward so far. I should pull arm three. But that would be a bad idea. You want to explore. Because maybe the first time you pull arm two, it gave you a bad reward, but that was just the luck of the draw. Next time you pull it, its actual expected reward might be much higher. So that's the exploration. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. OK. So this is a pure exploration exploitation case. Because how do we handle this? Look, the first case, which we call the planning case, is completely trivial. The planning case is a case where you know everything about the world. So you know the expected rewards of each arm. 
Then what do you do? Just pull the arm with the largest expectation. It's a simple computation. You're done. Just keep pulling that arm. That's the optimal policy. So in a planning setting, you don't face any problems. There's no exploration exploitation problem. The interesting case, of course, is a learning case where you don't know these expected rewards. You just pull an arm and you get a random reward from the whatever distribution is associated with that arm. Okay? So this is the case we are most interested in. All right, so here is, the, yes? What do you mean to say it's far more challenging in quantities? Ah, yes. Uh, let's see. So here the planning problem is really straightforward, right? I'm giving you some distribution over rewards for each arm. You have to compute the expectation, which may be slightly challenging or may be completely simple. And you have to take the max over all these n quantities, you're done. Later on, we'll talk about MDPs and POMDPs, where even if I tell you everything there is to know, computing the optimal behavior is a computationally expensive operation. Here, it's pretty straightforward. So, it, so planning in bandits is a trivial problem. Planning in MDPs and POMDPs is not that trivial. We'll talk about, in fact, I'll go there as soon as I finish with bandits. OK, so let's look at the most obvious learning algorithm. It's called the epsilon greedy exploration algorithm. So we're going to do learning, which means we're going to do exploration exploitation. We can't simply exploit, right? Because what will happen? I pull the first arm. It gives me a positive reward. I'm only going to keep pulling that arm. So I can't do pure exploitation. So what do I do? I do a little bit of exploration. So here's a very basic exploration exploitation idea, very simple idea, called epsilon greedy. Greedy means do what, greedy means exploit. So another way, another way of saying this algorithm would be explore with probability epsilon, exploit with probability one minus epsilon. Okay? So the algorithm is for all time, t going from one and so on, you maintain an an action value estimate, Q sub T of I, is the empirical average of the reward obtained until time T of arm I. So it's the, you've pulled whatever you've done so far. For every arm, you're maintaining the empirical average of the reward, because that's the estimate of its mean, mean reward. Let me just finish this and then I'll, OK? So at every time step, you toss a coin with probability epsilon. You pick a uniformly random action. Probably one minus epsilon, you take the action, that's the best. Let me explain some notation here. So when you are exploiting, action at time t, a sub t, will be the action, will be the arm or action that maximizes. So the arg max means the argument that maximizes q sub t of i, the i that maximizes. So that's the notation. Very simple. Yes, you had a hand up. Epsilon is what it is. In general, you would pick epsilon small. But here, is, I'll, I'll talk about what you can say in a few minutes. Then I'll have to make assumptions about epsilon. Right now, epsilon is what it is, right? It can be between 0 and 1. Yes? Is this exactly stochastic local search, or say, like random noise search, basically? It is search. It is a stochastic search. Is it local search? There's no locality here. Yes, except for locality, it's just that. Except for the word local, because there is no structure to the space here. It's just, it is a kind of a stochastic search. OK, very simple algorithm. OK, how will it behave for different values of epsilon? So here's time, or number of actions, right, on the x-axis. Here on the y-axis is the expected cumulative reward for, uh, that you would get if you were, so it's, so it's an expected curve, right? And if you choose epsilon equal to one, which means you're picking actions uniformly randomly, right? There's no exploitation, it's only exploration. So then you'll get some flat curve, which is the average of pulling all the arms with equal probability. If you, incre if you decrease epsilon, what will happen is basically you will asymptote to a larger 
reward, larger cumulative reward. But you will get there slower. So the smaller the epsilon, the higher the asymptote, but the slower the learning. Why is the asymptote lower when the epsilon is larger? Because if epsilon is 0.4, then 40% of the time you're not going to take the optimal action. Even when you've learned everything you have, there is to learn. So that will asymptote lower. Then, so the smaller the epsilon, the better in the limit. But the slower you learn because you're exploring less. So this is a fundamental trade-off, right? The more you explore, the worse you might do, but the more you will learn, and eventually when you exploit, you'll do better. Yes? No, it's a uh, oh, it's cumulative reward. That shouldn't be. I, I should have meant the average reward. A average reward per time step, which will asymptote. Yes, I shouldn't use the word cumulative. Same thing, it'll just slower rate of convergence, but higher asymptotes. You should get to the optimal one, but infinitely late. Right? There is some, there is some uh, average reward per time step, which is higher than all these curves for just taking the optimal action. How do you find optimal action? Somebody help. I, I want to engage more of you so you don't go to sleep. Uh, how do we define the optimal action? Somebody help me answer that. What any? Value? Sorry? Raise your hand so I can see you. What an oracle would tell you at any given time. But more formally, yes, that's right. But what is the optimal action formally? Highest, expected, reward. highest expected reward. Every arm is an expected reward. That's what the oracle will give you, of course. So there's a well defined notion of there could be more than one optimal action, but that's okay. They'll have the same value. It's okay, so a very simple algorithm, and this idea is, you know, it's, it's prevalent throughout reinforcement learning. Epsilon greedy is actually not a very bad way. That's, that sounds a very British way of saying it. It's not a bad way of, of, of exploring. Um, okay, so, but now let's try to get a result. Here's, an, here's a result we'll get, which is a pack style. You've seen, everybody's seen pack results this, in this summer school. Yes, more people nod if you've seen a pack style result. I don't have to explain pack style. You've seen it? No? Yes. Okay, good. I'll say a little bit more then. I, I thought you would have seen many pack style results, but maybe not. Okay, so an algorithm is epsilon delta pack with some sample complexity, T. Sample complexity means how many actions have been pulled. If within We're going to let you explore for some time, but not too long. After which, you have to pick an action, and I want that action to be good. So I'll say it again. The objective is, here's how we're going to deal with exploration. I'm going to just let you explore for a while, however you want, but not for too long. And once you're done, you can pick an action, and that action better be pretty good, or at least high probability be pretty good. I'm going to try every action a certain number of times, compute the empirical reward, empirical average reward, the empirical mean of each arm, return the arm that looks the best. That must, I sure, surely I can try every action enough times to be pretty confident that the arm I'm going to return is going to be pretty good. Right? I'm hoping that many of you can do the theoretical um, 
analysis in your heads to see why this must be true, because I'm going to show you many more examples of this. So I want to make sure you get this one. So here's the, again the algorithm. The, I'm going to explore for a while, return an arm, and I want to be sure. I want to be. I want to know with high probability that the arm is pretty good. Pretty good meaning within epsilon of the optimal. High probability meaning with probability at least one minus delta. So here's the algorithm, right? I just pick every arm. I run it for some k number of time steps. I pull arm one, k times, computer's empirical average. Pull arm two, k times, computer's empirical average, return the highest one. This must work, right? There must be some k for which this works. Who can give me the intuition behind it? Pretty straightforward. Who wants to give me the intuition behind why this must work? I'm not yet asking you why this must work for small k. Just this must work in, without the constraint of small k, where k is the number of times you, what am I calling it here? Um, yes, give me the intuition. Maybe I'm missing the point, but aren't you basically figuring out the empirical reward for each arm? Then? The more often I pull an arm, the better the estimate of its mean I'm getting. If I were to, k were to be infinity, if I were to pull each arm a gazillion times, I'm going to be very, very accurate. So all I need to know is how accurate all of my estimates are going to be if I pull each arm some k times. And then I can work backwards from epsilon delta to ask what k should be so I can make this guarantee. Right? So this is a simple trick. I know if I pull the arm so many times what my distribution or empirical mean would be. And I know I want epsilon optimal with probability 1 minus delta. And I work my way backwards and ask, how often do I have to pull each arm so that I can be epsilon optimal with probability at least 1 minus delta? That's it. Let me show you this a little bit more detail, so because I'm going to do many of these. Uh, so we use what's called the Hufting inequality. How many of you, have you seen Hufting inequality this, in this uh, summer school? No. Well, I'm surprised, but OK, let me, let me state it. Um, let x sub i, the set x sub i, be, uh, or this set, which each element of which is x sub i, be iid samples from some random variable x. And let's say the x is a range of a and b, or from a to b. Some arbitrary distribution, except its range is a and b, it's finite domain. Then for all real k, if I take the sample average of n samples, the difference from the mean, the true mean, will be greater than k with at most this much probability. So what is this saying? This is basically telling me, if I want this probability to be small, given a k, it tells me what n should be. It tells me how many samples I need in order to be epsilon sure with probability 1 minus delta. Right? K will correspond to the epsilon, and this quantity will be correspond to delta. So I just plug that in and compute what n should be. And what does it turn out to be? It turns out to be this, that if I pull each arm 2 by epsilon squared log 2n by delta, Sorry, I'm confusing n's now. This n is a number of arms here. Okay? If I pull each arm this many times, then I'm guaranteed, well, I know that I have an epsilon optimal arm with probability 1 minus delta. And if you want to see the proof, it's pretty straightforward. Um, do I want to show the proof? I probably don't want to show the proof. Just, it's in the slides. It's just an application of Huffington's inequality. Any questions about this setup? Right? So now I've just shown you how to solve the exploration exploitation problem in a particular way. You get to explore for a while, and then you're committed to exploiting thereafter. It's not the only way to, to think about exploration exploitation. I'll show you more ways of thinking about exploration exploitation. Yes? Sorry, what's that? What's that? Is, uh, oh, uh, let's see. The trick is, look. Um, let A star be the optimal action. Um, consider an action A that is 
more than epsilon worse than the optimal action. In other words, I don't want to return A, right? So which means, when will I return A? When the empirical average for A is more than the empirical average for the optimal action. Will I split the epsilon into epsilon by two? That can happen in two ways. Either the empirical average for A overestimates its true mean by epsilon by two, or the empirical average for the optimal action underestimates by epsilon by two. So then I do the or, and that is, I can upper bound that by just the plus of the probabilities. Then I apply Huffding's rule, plug L back in, and I get delta by N, which is what I want. And then by union bound, because I want this to be true for all the arms, that will multiply by N, and I get delta. If you've never seen a pack style proof, you should, because it's actually very intuitive and simple. And you can use this as an example to, to see the pack style proof. But, but intuitively, it should be pretty straightforward why this must be true. The more samples I get, the more accurate my mean will be, and the more accurate my answer will be, and so on. Yes? But there's still always some small. Yeah, delta takes care of that. Yeah, there's still some delta that, even though you did it, you still didn't get it. Absolutely. You can get really unlucky with small probability. Can you use that to take another level up and say, how many times do I have to run the whole thing? Like, how many times? You can just make delta smaller and run it more. Oh, okay, right. right? You can always do that. Because delta is something you give to the algorithm, and then it computes what the number of samples should be. Let's talk about a different formal exploration and exploitation, which comes up from the idea of notion of regret. I am going very slowly. I just looked at it. Time and it's almost three. OK, that's OK. I'd rather you, uh, how many of you want me to go faster? This is a question, actually, when I ask in class, almost everybody is too embarrassed to raise their hand because they don't want to be seen as being nerdy. But, but tell me if you want, but, but do raise your hand if you want me to go faster. Only, only a very few. I guess those of you who have seen reinforcement learning, this is pretty slow. OK, let me try to go a little bit faster. OK, bounded regret. What's the idea of regret? The idea of regret is, look, I am acting in some way. I could have been acting optimally. How much did I lose by not acting optimally from the beginning? That's regret. So regret is, uh, after k actions, is k times what you would have gotten if you had pulled the optimal arm. This is expected regret, minus what you actually did. So E of ti is the expected number of times you pull arm i. E of ri is the expected return from ri. So this difference is regret. And it turns out, I won't show this, that there's a lower bound, ancient lower bound, which shows that basically you can't get regret smaller than log of k. So now let me show you a very simple algorithm called UCB1, which is an algorithm, it turns out, that is at the heart of a, of a recent reinforcement learning algorithm called UCT. Um, I'm forgetting what it stands for. Upper confidence trees? Doesn't stand for anything. OK. Um, but I'll talk, talk about the algorithm tomorrow. So it's, it's the core of one of these algorithms. So UCB1, it's a very simple idea. Let me explain the intuition to you. It's always going to pull. What arm is it going to pull? It's going to pull an arm greedily. Now, you might think, well, that's a terrible idea. You don't want to exploit only. Except what it does is it adds an amount of extra reward to the estimate of the value of each arm to make sure, with high probability, that that arm, that the estimate you have is optimistic for that arm. So let me say it again. It's a very powerful idea that this is an example of. It's called optimism under uncertainty. Suppose, suppose I was, under what circumstances can I always act, can I always exploit? I want to go away from worrying about exploration and exploitation to always exploit, but I want to do it with a certain trick so that always exploiting leads to enough exploration. How do I do that? I do that by basically maintaining optimistic estimates of the value of every arm. If I could maintain an optimistic estimate of the value of every arm, and then act greedily, I'm OK. Why is that? Suppose my estimate of the reward, mean reward of every arm is optimistic. By optimistic, it means, I mean it's more than the true reward. And then I act purely greedily, a purely exploit. I'm OK. Why is that? Yeah. 
So that's true. But why can't he get stuck with the wrong arm? It's the optimism. That's right. Basically, the idea is, look, if I'm, pulling, if I'm getting stuck on an arm, it means that has the largest reward. But I'm pulling it. So I'm going to, I'm going to improve its estimate. As long as my amount of optimism isn't very large, I'm OK. Because if I'm not pulling some other arm and its estimate is optimistic, then it's lower than the arm I'm pulling. So I don't want to pull it anyway. Make sense? If I'm stuck on an arm, I'm improving its estimate. As long as my optimism isn't very big, I'm OK. So there's a whole bunch of algorithms, a whole bunch of ideas in reinforcement learning that all have the following form. I'm going to start optimistic estimates. I'm going to maintain optimism. But I'm going to shrink that optimism slowly over time, the amount of optimism, so that, and then I'm always going to act greedily. And if you do that, in effect, you do good exploration exploitation. So here's an algorithm called UCB1. I guess there's a UCB2. It's the simplest one, which basically maintains the empirical average, but adds to it a quantity that goes down as you try the arms more often. TI is the number of times you've pulled the arm. So as TI increases, the additive bonus you get is smaller. OK? And it goes up as you increase as time goes on. So if you haven't tried an arm for a very long time, you'll try it. And if you've tried a very arm for a lot, its reward bonus will go down. And turns out you can, this quantity is guaranteed, I'm sorry, guaranteed is the wrong word. With high probability, this quantity maintains optimism. Okay, and basically you get it again from the Huffing bound. And it turns out you can prove for this algorithm that the expected regret is log k, where k is the number of actions you've done, which means the uh, per time step regret is going to zero, because log k over k is going to zero. I won't get into the, the, the other terms and this just in the interest of time and moving faster. OK, so that was it. That was my summary of bandit, bandits. I really I wanted to spend time on exploration and exploitation because it is a key problem underlying reinforcement learning. And I basically showed you three sorts of ideas. One is epsilon greedy. Right? Epsilon greedy because it, it, does the, sort of the, it does exploration. And you can control epsilon and, and control how much exploration you do. The other idea was to explore for a while, get some good estimates, and then exploit. <coughs> and the third idea was this optimism under uncertainty. And we'll see these ideas carried over to all of reinforcement learning settings, even when you add other problems like delayed reward and like generalization. Any questions? I'm finished with bandits. I want to switch on. I want to move on to MDPs. Yes? Do you get different results if you have like, non-uniform distributions over the rewards for the bandits? Because really, it seems like I didn't. There was nothing in here that assumed uniform distributions. I just assumed finite support. So the background has, like, um, you're, you're saying a difference between expectations. But really, like, if, you, if you talk about the rank of the army pull, that, that seems like it might give you something. So there are some results available that don't assume anything about distributions. There are some results available that if you know that it's a normally distributed, for example, then you can exploit it. So there's a, a range of results that are, that are available. The, res, the result I told you about the naive algorithm doesn't assume anything about the form of the distribution other than the AB bound. There are tighter bounds that you can get if you make assumptions about the form of the distribution. Yes? Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, bandits are a very active area of research. I'm surprised that you haven't, somebody hasn't talked about bandits because it's very active in <laughs> Yahoo and, and uh, Microsoft and all these places for ad, ad placement sort of stuff. Um, adversarial setting, I simply mean there are algorithms that have surprising bounds on regret even when 
an adversary is allowed to set what happens when you pull an arm. So no assumptions about the, the stationary distributions associated with each arm. No assumptions about that at all. You can get pretty nice bounds for algorithms uh, that throw away all statistical assumptions and allow adversarial setting of what you get when you put it on. And that's, there's a, there's a b bunch of work by Peter Auer, A-U-E-R, if you're interested in adversarial settings, that will give you results about, uh, about the adversary. Setting. I wasn't planning on covering it because I'm trying to cover things in bandits that are applied to MDPs. And I'm not gonna do adversarial setting in MDPs, so I'm gonna stay with, stay with this. But if you're interested in those settings, come talk to me after the break and I'll tell you more about the settings. Okay, let me switch on words to MDPs. Before I switch to MDPs, let me show you, you can see this. Let me show you an app, let me show you a reinforcement learning problem demo. So here is a, you can see it, right? I can't see if you can see it. Okay, this is a, a simulated robot that's going to learn how to walk. So let's turn, let's, let's reduce, so this is doing epsilon greedy. I'm controlling the epsilon parameter. So it's zero, no exploration, so it's only going to exploit. I'm going to run it. It's exploiting, which means it's got stuck somewhere. It's trying some actions, and it's stuck. Let me turn epsilon up to one. So it's only ex exploring, and now, of course, it's trying all kinds of actions. So we'll talk about state space and action space in a few minutes, but I just want you to see this picture. So now it's trying all kinds of actions. Let me let it run for 30,000 steps of training, Q-learning. And it's still exploring randomly, so of course you can't see what, it's, what it has learned. Let me reduce it down, and here's what it's learned. It's being rewarded for walking, right? Let's see if it gets even better if I let it explore some more. Let it run for 30,000 steps. Reduce epsilon down to zero. I've seen much faster walking, so let's try. Uh, let's try another. This will take some time. Let me set up the um, slide. We'll come back to this. OK. So now I'm going to switch to the MDPs, which that problem was an example. Um, so I'm going to do the MDPs, and I'm going to do uh, what's called planning problem. Yes, somebody had the hand up. A break. OK, take a break. Good. Those of you who are impatient to get to more advanced material, most of the advanced material will be tomorrow. But I will do uh, contractions, value iteration, policy iteration, average case, that sort of stuff today. I'll get to the more challenging stuff tomorrow. Yes.